we're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like most of the people are on who have RSVP'd. Um, so first of all, I'd like to just thank you for coming to our January 2nd Sunday on the Hoagland House. Um, I am probably a new face to a lot of the regulars. Um, my name is Natalie. I'm the research specialist with the Douglas County Historical Society and um, just kind of given Emma a week off. Um, so that'll be a little different. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just announce our two upcoming um, February and March talks. Um, on February 14th, we're going to be having Patrick Jones um, who will be presenting a talk called In Their Own Image, The Hidden History of African Americans in Omaha. And on March 14th, we're having Brian Kokensparger, who's giving a talk titled John A. Creighton, Blazing the First Internet. So those should both be really interesting talks and they're being, both of them are being made possible by Humanities Nebraska. Um, so thanks to them. Um, but for this week, we'll get back to the Hoagland talk. Um, we will have, um, You'll be able to answer, ask any questions if you have, if anything comes up while, if you think of anything while we're going, um, feel free to just use the Q&A button down at the bottom, type me a question, and then I'll pose them all to Medora at the end. Um, otherwise, let's just get started. Our guest this week is Medora Elliott Harper. Um, she is the great granddaughter of George and Iantha Hoagland, who you'll be learning about um, today. She spent her whole childhood at 520 North 48th Street here in Omaha. Um, she attended Dundee School, Brownell Hall, Grinnell College, and Omaha University. And then she opened the Douglas County Youth Center in 1956. Um, she was married to Tom Harper for almost 60 years, and she has four generations of family living here in Omaha. So lots of history there as well. Um, and today she's going to tell us about the beautiful family home, the Hoagland House. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up the start of our presentation and we can get going. All right, Medora, I'll hand it over to you. So you can hey, get started. good afternoon, everybody, fellow Zoomers. A new thing for me to be doing. Right now, this morning, I thought about doing all this and I felt like I was back in school again, although this time I was the teacher, not the student. Now I'm here to talk about a house which I, at the time, I thought that was kind of a strange subject, but when I thought about it, I realized how many stories a house could only tell if they could. So, here I am to talk about the George A. Hoagland house. I'm going to go back a little bit first about the Hoaglands and how they ended up here and how the house became to be. The Hoaglands came to the Americas from the Netherlands and they settled in New Jersey. There was a George T. Hoagland, and he moved his family out to St. Joe, St. Joe, Missouri, sorry. And he, uh, he established three lumber yards in that area. One was in Hannibal, Missouri, one was in Boonville, and one was in St. Joe. And he was very successful with the lumber yards. Obviously, they were all on the river because that was the easiest way to haul, haul lumber. Along the way, George T. decided that maybe Omaha, Nebraska needed a lumber yard, so he was going to establish one here. He had a son, George A. Hoagland, who was being educated in Missouri at the time. However, the colleges were suspended because of the War of Rebellion. George T. asked George A., his son, if he would like to become a clerk in the new lumber yard in Omaha, Nebraska. Obviously, George A did become a clerk and went on to become far more than a clerk. He was the president of the Lumberyard. The Lumberyard in Omaha was first George T. Hoagland, then obviously became George A. Hoagland and son, his son being W. W. Hoagland, who, who followed him in, in business. The Lumberyard was down below the old ex Arban Bridge. The one in Omaha was below the old ex Arban Bridge right off the river, and there also was another one in Council Bluffs. George A. Hoagland came to Omaha in 1861 to help with the lumber yard, and he was very successful with both. Now I'm going to go back to the Hoaglands. He, he met, or he married Iantha I Clementina Wyman in 1864. Her family had come to Omaha from Wisconsin. Her dad was the first postmaster in Omaha, and her brother was 
a treasurer of the United States two times. As I said, they married in 1864 and they had seven children. They lived different places in downtown Omaha when Mr. Holman decided that he should build his own house. So he built himself a house on 16th and Howard, which you're looking at now. And the story is that they were 23 steps up from the, from the walk or the road and more steps into the house. He built this place and included the carriage house behind, which was big enough for a house itself today. As the business progressed in Omaha, he felt that the business was becoming too close to his residence and he wanted to move it. So here we have the house that he decided he would move to the villages of Dundee. The house, if you look over to the map, the small on the lower half, the, the larger yellow thing is the Hoagland house and the other is the carriage house. The bigger purple square behind it was a department store and it was the Bennett department store. The one on the left, the purple on the left, it's the longer looking one and you can see on here where it says theater, it was the Boyd Theater. Now, I don't really have any idea how long those lasted. And so, but this gives you an idea of how the business was growing and, and moving in on his residence. So he wanted to move his house, but it was too big for the, for the wagons, for the horses. So he cut the house in half from east to west. He also moved the carriage house, which you can also see in this picture. It took three wagons three wagons to hold both the pieces of the house and, and the garage was all horse drawn. The house was moved in 1904 and it took six months to move it to its final location, which is 48th and Cass. <clears throat> it was started and went up St. Mary's as I understand it and Harney and Farm and by the time it got, oh, it, <coughs> they had to stop several times because we would have they would have rainy weather, and of course it couldn't go anywhere. The horses had to wait. By the time it got up to the old creek, uh, which is now Saddle Creek Boulevard, as you all probably know, between Turner Boulevard and Farnham, the house had to stop. All the horses had to stop because it was the wagons were too big to get over the creek. So Mr. Holden went ahead and built himself a bridge so that his house could continue. The house did continue, also went on over to Dodge Street, and it could only be moved at night once it hit Dodge Street because all the streetcar wires were, were overhead and they had to take all the wires down. Up it goes on Dodge Street to 48th Street and on up to Cass Street, and up the hill and it's put back together, and they said it was so well put back together that not a piece of plaster was, was cracked inside. Now, I have backtrack here one time. Uh, the house was removed and Mr. Holden built a building on the very same corner. It was, there's the building. And if you note above the first floor where the windows are, there is kind of a narrow strip around and on the south side. I think even today, if you were underneath the facade, it, it says Holden Block. The most notable that stayed in this building was Orchard and Wilhelm. They were there for many, many years in a very successful department store. I, I think, but I'm not 100% certain, but I think that possibly OPPD is there now. It's still very busy down there with the orphan close, etc. So now we get back to the house on its new foundation. There it is. All right, we'll start with the exterior. You're looking at the front steps up to the front door. Uh, the top of the house looks sort of plain now. There was a lot of iron work up on top, but they had to remove all the iron after it was moved out here because it might get in the way of low flying aircraft. If you go up the driveway to the left, there's the port cashier, which I always thought was quite fascinating because you could come out the side door and never have any inclement weather because you're either your horses or your car machines, as my grandmother later called them. They were great for you there. You always had dry access. 
if you continue on behind, you can see the you can see the carriage house or the garage part of it anyway. Uh, this, of course, was the place to house the horses, the help. There was upstairs. There was a hayloft, and there were living quarters for the people to take care of all the dog. Sorry, horses, etc. Uh, the back door that where deliveries came was on around behind the house, which you can't see now. The interior of the house was fascinating. There was an awful lot of wood effect in there, which you can see in these two pictures. The one on the left shows the top of the staircase and the wood which matched the wainscoting, which is all over the entire house. Straight ahead on this left one, there's a picture there now, but it used to be, well, that'll come up later. It used to be a little holding with faucets and up on the attic they had a barrel that, that would hold, would be filled with rainwater and you could get the rainwater out of that. It's, it's shown right there and it was on the, well there's a door, let's go back to the other one. Okay, so the doors there that you're looking at would have gone back to the servants quarters. There were two full bed, two bedrooms and a full bath back there. Now this is showing the upstairs of which there were uh, five bedrooms. And down on the, on the right side, we go up to the lovely looking staircase. Again, you see all the wainscoting. You can see the plaster that they talked about earlier, which there was not even a crack in the plaster. <coughs> Excuse me, behind the new old post is the famous banister to all of us. My sisters and I slid down that. My cousins lived down there, although they said they also put cardboard boxes on it so they could go a little faster. If you look at the height of this, if anybody was falling off, it was kind of, a, kind of a big fall. My daughter even said, you even allowed us to do that? Well, we all did it, so we didn't think much about it. But it, it was a beautiful thing. That, as I said, goes upstairs and right at the top is the same door you saw on, on the left. The inside or downstairs, there were four fireplaces and upstairs there were three. All the fireplaces downstairs were very, very ornate. The upstairs ones were certainly nice, but they were all made, made of marble. Two of the rooms, two of the rooms downstairs had matching fireplaces and huge, gorgeous uh, chandeliers that were cloisonne and brass and just Lovely. We have a picture of that uh, fireplace in, in one of these. Um, the dining room was outstanding. This, these two are both the dining room. The one on the left shows the colorful and also how much wood was used. Mr. Hogan certainly believed in his trade. The wood was, oh, I think they had ebony, mahogany, oak. It was lovely. The dining room had beam ceilings, a lovely chandelier, as you can see. The big sideboard over there was built in. It matched the fireplace and the dining room table and chairs. The one on the right shows you pretty much as the room had been empty. That is not the original dining room table and chairs. I went to my uncle's house. The floor was parquet with inlaid wood and all pegged, no nails in the whole place. It was gorgeous. The dining room was certainly a place where we all gathered. Christmas and Easter were extremely big. Um, the dining room table that was then in there would seat probably 25 people. We had many, many meals in, in this particular room. We, as kids, we're not allowed to eat in there. We had to eat in the kitchen until we had proper manners and respect. Then we could be moved to the table, the big table with the adults and we would sit there really very quietly. And when we were through and wanted away from the table, we had to ask our grandmother, may I please be excused? That was rather formal upbringing, you might say. Anyway, it, it was it was a very very good very good time very busy time. Uh, there there were fifteen rooms in the house that doesn't include the attic or the basement. I would say on the first level there were what we would say today were four 
living room. The two up front matched with the fireplaces, which we'll see in a minute or two. There was one room, there was one room up front that had the had several heads, a la deer, bison, and I don't remember what the third one was. My cousin and I and our husbands thought it would be very amusing one time. We were there and everybody else was on vacation. So we put a cigarette in the mouth of the deer. Well, it took probably a good month or so before my aunt noticed that when she was not the least bit amused by our little endeavor. We thought it was pretty funny though. So anyway, that basically that's how many rooms were in the downstairs. There were, there were births there. There were weddings there. There were receptions. My parents' wedding reception was in this house. There were debuts. Um, there was a baby shower that I even gave one time there much later on. And I might add, I think that particular baby might just be watching this program right now. Anyway, it, it was a good time and certainly plenty, plenty of room to en entertain. Two things that started in that particular, in the actual house where the Visiting Nurse Association was, was founded in this house by several ladies who got together to form the organization. There was another one that carried on for about 60 years and it was called the Emma Hoagland Flower Mission. George A. and his wife, Iantha, one of their children named Emma, had quite a few medical issues and spent a lot of time in hospitals and the lady loved flowers. She had felt, and I think she died in her 20s, anyway, she felt that everybody in the hospital, every room should have flowers. Upon her death, uh, George A. Hoagland formed the Emma Hoagland Flower Mission and my grandmother, Mrs. W.W. W. DeHogan, uh, carried on the flower mission for years. I said, I think it was in operation for about 60 years. We were allowed to go down and, and help with the flowers. By going down, I mean, there was a warehouse downtown. It seems to me it was Wilcox building, but I'm not straight on that. And the florists would all deliver flowers to this building. And we would then work, it was on a Thursday, we would put all these little flowers into bouquets and little nosegays, what have you, in every single bed in the hospital in the city of Omaha that had flowers. In the beginning, I guess Mrs. George A. Hoagland would go around and collect the flowers herself, and several people had gardens where they would donate these flowers. It was, it was quite an endeavor. Later, it was stopped because Omaha started to have far more hospitals and rooms and they just didn't really want to continue the effort. I have to go backtrack on that. We don't have to go back to that on the garage. I know when I was a freshman in high school, we gave a Halloween party in, in the garage, which was a lot of fun. In the whole house itself, there were 13 foot high ceilings. The windows were all eight foot high and there were 64 windows in the house. So it was a fairly bright place. Um, we had the attic. You'll see some, I don't know if, if we're there. Okay, we're back to the, on the left side, you'll see one of the gorgeous, huge fireplaces that was in the, the two front rooms were adjacent to one another. They had the same chandeliers, which of course everything was gas at one time, they became electric. Again, you'll see this plaster on the top. I think there's a name for that, but I can't come up with that. It's all very well designed. Uh, the fireplace went from floor to ceiling, as you can see. Wood, lots of pretty, pretty wood, and the mirrors were, were full length. Across the way, it was like the same room, which later was kind of more like a music room. <clears throat> the, lower, the lower picture is up in the attic, and I went over there to take pictures before the house was, was to be torn down. And we thought we should dress accordingly. That's my cousin and my, and my, my, and my children. It was kind of a fun thing to do. The house, the house, Mr. Well, I should, all right. The, this gets a little back and forth and I'm sorry if I jump, for, jump back and forth. 
Mrs. Hogan, Mrs. George A. Hogan died in 1919 and George A. Hogan died in 1923. But before that, as I had mentioned, W. W. Hogan was in in business with, with, with his dad. There was a house next door. This was 510 North 48. There was a house right next door, which is 520 North 48. George A. Hogan built this particular house and his son, W. W. Hoagland and his wife, Florence Jessica Boothroyd Hoagland, that's W.W. when he was a little boy, they lived in this house and they had their three children, my mother, my aunt, and my uncle. Upon the death of Mr. Hoagland in 1923, the W.W. Hoagland family moved next door into the big house. Now, this house became the residence of the Hoagland's oldest daughter and her husband, who happened to have been my parents. So my sister and sisters and I grew up in this house, although pretty obviously we spent a ton of time next door in my grandmother's house. It was very important to all of us. I think I said earlier what happened, W.W. W. Hogan took over the the, law, the, law, the lumber business. And when he died, my mother became president of the entire firm. As time went on, the Mrs. Hogan remained in, in her, Mrs. W. W. Hogan remained in her house until her death. Upon her death, the house was put up for sale and was bought by the Alu Corporation, who really was Mr. A. V. Al Sorensen, and he later built the after the place was demolished, he built the, the library that faces Cass Street. Before the house was, was demolished, Mr. Kingman from Johnson Memorial was there. He had hoped that they could retain the house in its, in its form, but that, was not, that could not happen. Too much upkeep, etc. So Mr. Kingman took quite a few of the architectural items from the house, like the fireplace, some of the plaster, some of the wainscoting, whatever he could. It was his hope that Jocelyn could prepare a period room for the history for Jocelyn, but that never happened. Um, the wrecking ball took the house. There we are. The wrecking ball took the house, but it certainly never took the memories that I have of this particular house where, where, I, where, I, where I grew up. I want to thank you all for watching and I especially want to thank Natalie for her picture presentation and all the help she has been. Um, as, as she said, if you have any questions, go ahead. I don't, I, I hope I've covered quite a bit and made it interesting for you and thank you. <laughs>
1965. And it is currently the A.B. Sorensen Library. Right. And 520, is that still standing? 520 was was demolished in 1953 and on the very same site facing the California street are apartments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have, we're wondering, was there a very large domestic staff working in the house? Do you know? I don't, I can't answer that for certain because uh, by the time I came along, they weren't having staff, but I said the, there was a court, living quarters over the garage for all mm -hmm. the people for horses, and I don't even know if they had a chauffeur or what, possibly. But there were two bedrooms in the in the main house, as I, I mentioned, there were servants. But mm -hmm. as to the actual staff, I really don't know. The kitchen was huge. The stove was huge. The dough oven at that time, and of course, it was wood, wood burning in the beginning. There were like mm -hmm. two pantries in the kitchen, and... The, it was very handy for waiting on the people in the dining room, but I don't actually know how much staff. When you were growing up, was there a cook that you would eat with in the kitchen, or did your grandma prepare food at all? Or In the, in the early days, I recall a, I even know her name, remember her name, there was a lady who did come in and cook the meals. Much later, um, my grandmother and my aunt, any of the rest of us did what we could, but that's much later. Okay. Um, and wondering, um, what happened to most of the furnishings of the house? Well, I mentioned the parts that Mr. Kingman took to Jocelyn. My mm -hmm. aunt at the time um, built her, built, she and her husband built a house and they took an awful lot of the furnishings. Some of them went to my uncle, who by the way, lived right across the street with his two boys. Uh, that the dining room set went over there and some of the large pieces of furniture. I have one, but mostly I would say an awful lot of the usable ones went, went to my aunt who was building her own house and later those went to her daughter. Okay. Her daughter grew up in the house. Okay. Also. And um, so I know the streets were not paved when they were moving the house and that was no. part of the issue with the rain and whatnot. Um, were right. they paved? Were they paved by the time you were growing up, or yes. was it still? They were okay. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was your favorite? Oh, you can you can even see the driveway paved going. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and what was your favorite memory of the house? Probably just being there. Probably the flowers. The meals, the activities, the Easter egg hunts. Um, there was a sunroom off the front porch, which came later, and I think that was built for my grandmother, who was very fond of flowers. And I think that was the beginning of my true love for flowers and plants. And just ask my family, they would certainly be agree to that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the gatherings, the people, Oh, there were an awful lot of people in and out that for years, it took me a long time to figure out who was who. Did you have a lot of cousins? Uh, I had, well, not so much through the Hovland side. I said mm -hmm. my aunt, my mother's sister had one daughter and she actually grew up in that house. Mm -hmm. My uncle, my mother's brother had uh, two sons who are both still living in Omaha. Mm -hmm. Um, another question about the house. Ah, did, a, did it convert to central heating or were fireplaces used to heat for the whole duration? Uh, fireplaces weren't used as much as there was steam heat. Oh, okay. Later, I can, well, I remember early down in the basement, which was huge also, there was, of course, was coal, lots of coal. Um, but no, there wasn't any central anything, not, that, <laughs> not ever. And you didn't really need it, you know. Is I don't remember any of those houses like that, including ours that were big enough and the tall ceilings. They were always pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I might add, nobody really had so much air conditioning there. Mm -hmm. And all those windows, too. Um, ah, question about the lumber yard. Um, did, the lumber yard th did the lumber yard move to a different location eventually, or did it close down? No, they both remained in the... The, the one that was downtown under the bridge, um, 
it had its share of problems. I think it was 1881, there was a big flood on the Missouri, so they lost a lot of their inventory. That one remained in operation. And the one, I think it was sold or maybe just, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent certain on that. And that would have been probably the forties, maybe more like wartime following World War II. The one in Council Bus remained in operation probably until the, uh, probably about until the 50s. And, and by you, then, there was an mm -hmm. awful lot of competition with, we had quite a mm -hmm. few lumber yards mm -hmm. in this, in this city. And your mother was president. Um, what, what year was she named president? That was the 40s, right? 1932, upon the death of, of her father, she became president of, of the firm. Hmm. And do you have do you have childhood memories of her being president, or had it passed on to someone by that time? Or no, she remained she re remained president until they were either sold or I'm, I'm not sure of the final part of that. Uh, we went down to the lumber yard every Friday. We made a trip down to the lumber yard, and I don't know what in the world my mother was doing, but we could run around and. And then if we were lucky, we would go, we were allowed to, from there, we'd go up to Kresge's where we could have a frosted mall. That was kind of a big deal. <laughs> Council Bluffs, I went over that one. I remember going to all of them. I didn't know what was going on, but mm -hmm. I was there. <laughs> um, and someone else is wondering, in terms of the living situation, was it very common during the time you were growing up for families to live next to each other? Well... Probably not. There were an awful lot of big old family places in Omaha, and I can't really say if I know they all lived in the same house or had different quarters. I think in this case, uh, uh, I think Georgie must have built the built the house for the son, who was not the rest of them. They, uh, most of them were married. There was one of his other sons that was, had his own lumber company, not very long, but briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, as to, I don't know. We we I I like to kind of refer to it now that we kind of had our own compound. We mm -hmm. probably had a good block block worth of just two houses. Mm -hmm. Um, and someone's wondering about um the historical society. Did you do much of the research for this presentation at the historical society, or where did you find these photographs? Mm -hmm. Well, I had, I had quite a few myself. A lot of this, I was certainly familiar with it. Putting together was an entirely different story. And I have to say, you people, you Zoomers, are looking at the lady who was a big help in finding <laughs> in finding material and for us to try to put this, put it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Historical Society definitely had some photographs. I know some of your relatives had donated a lot, so that we had those studio portraits of pretty much everyone in the family that had right. been donated by, I believe one of your right. aunts, maybe. Um, we have a, a really cool taped interview that was done with your grandmother, no, your yeah. aunt. Your grandmother. Grand and aunt and the yep. two, two interviewers who were. Yep, and she, she tells the whole story of moving the house and she talks a lot about some of those numbers about like the number of windows and the three different kinds of wood and names all of the lots of very detailed features of the house. Um, so that was a really cool resource for us to have too. Just um, great house, great house for hide and seek, by the way. <laughs> but <laughs> um, and then oh, another question about um, just growing up in Omaha. Um, what memories do you have of Brownell Hall? Well. I have quite a few <laughs> and all very good memories. Brownell Hall, for those of you who don't know it, was a girls' school. Uh, it was an old building that looked pretty much like my grandmother's house. It was a huge old place, not there anymore, but that's where we went to school. And later the chapel was built. We did chapel three times three times a week and I loved Brownell. It it was it was a great education. <laughs> And where, where was that building located, the original Brownell University? Brownell? Yeah, or Brownell Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, saying, it's the same place as where it Brownell is. It is, okay. Now, it is okay. Now, they just tore down the old one. Gotcha. 
Um, one more question. In, in, the, in the 60s, Omaha was very good about tearing down most everything. But the old school of Brownie, maybe it needed to be, I don't know, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone who looks like maybe went to high school with a Hoagland, um, was Lawrence Hoagland a relative that you know of from Central Lord, High? Lord, well, yeah, Lori Hoagland. Uh, again, we're back to the George A. Sons and their sons. Lori, did somebody go to school with Lori? Yeah, it looks like somebody went to Central High in the 50s with oh, all right, Lawrence. All right. yep. well, I'm a bit older there. Yeah, Lori Hoagland's father was Lawrence Hoagland. So, and he had, well, anyway, yeah. Yeah, so relative, yep. Um, and then the last question, lots of people are wondering if this is being taped. And yes, it is being recorded. So this will be accessible in the future. I'm not sure exactly where or how, um, but maybe we can communicate that to everyone if it is gonna be posted somewhere, I'm not sure. But it is taped, so we do have the photographs and Medora's stories. Um, for, to be accessed in the future. Um, otherwise, does anybody have any additional questions that they're typing up? It doesn't look like any have been coming up in the last couple of minutes. So maybe we're good. Lots of people saying this is wonderful. Thank you so much. And indeed, thank you very much for <laughs> putting all this together and braving the Zoom video and um, putting these stories together for us. Um, oh, someone's wondering, do you know where your name is from? I'm assuming that's maybe the first name, Medora. You must be speaking of Medora because you'll yes. probably never hear it again. My mother went to school on the East Coast, and she had a friend named Medora. Um, later, I found out there are five, five cities, towns, whichever you want to call them, in the United States with the name Medora. Uh, probably mm -hmm. the most famous one is Medora, North Dakota, which was... Teddy Roosevelt's place to go, a la what would now be Camp David type thing. He went there for health reasons. Hmm. I know. Hmm. I, finally, I, did, when I was at Grinnell College. I met. I did meet somebody who had the middle name Medora, but I don't remember how she got it. Hmm. So. Hmm. Oh, that looks. All right, it looks like that is probably it for questions. Um, so thank you again. This has been a great talk. Very, very well attended. Very, very lively, I think. Um, so thank you to everyone else who has who has tuned in. Um, maybe we'll be able to do some similar Zooms uh, in the future. Um, I know old houses get a lot of people excited. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we can um, keep this going because there are so many here in Omaha. Um, so thank you to Medora and to everyone else. Uh, enjoy the rest of your second Sunday of the month um, and stay tuned for February and March. Um, I think we'll call it, call it a day. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you all. Bygone days. They were <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs>